Ah, oh, there you are. My name is Gary Sims, Ranger Authority, and today we're going to be answering the question, what is virtual reality? Virtual reality is an immersive computer system that mimics the world we see around us. It can also be used to create imaginary worlds, which is particularly useful for creating immersive gaming. VR itself isn't a new idea. In fact, it was first described in the 1930s, and the first VR system was built in the late 1960s. Its boon time came in the 1990s when companies like Sega and Nintendo started developing consumer level VR gaming products. How after a boom there is often a bust, and that is what happened with VR. Sega's product was never released and Nintendo's Virtual Boy was a commercial failure. And since then not much has changed at a consumer level. And it isn't just because of the computing power needed to do VR properly. Think about the size of laptops and mobile phones from that era. They were quite big. Therefore, to do VR headsets properly, a lot needed to change in terms of miniaturization, materials, displays, and of course, the computing power. And that's what's happened now. Now, almost after 20 years, VR is making a comeback. In 2012, Palmer Lucky started a Kickstarter campaign for an immersive virtual reality headset for video gaming. Called the Oculus Rift, it aimed to raise $250,000, but in the end raised an amazing $2.4 million. In 2013, John Carmack, famous for his 3D games like Doom and Quake, joined the Oculus team. The Oculus Rift is designed to be connected and used with a PC. However, Carmack helped develop a mobile version in collaboration with Samsung. The Samsung Gear VR uses a smartphone which is clipped into the headset to create a VR platform. It is an untethered solution which means there are no wires connected to a PC or other computing device. The smartphone's GPU is used to render the virtual world and the phone's display is split into half for the images needed by the left and right eyes. The headset also includes the head tracking module from the Oculus Rift. The original Gear VR only worked with the Note 4. However, Samsung recently released a new version to coincide with the launch of the Samsung Galaxy S6. Both these Gear VR versions carry the title Innovator Edition, meaning they are intended for early adopters and for developers. However, during a recent keynote speech at GDC, John Carmack said that the Gear VR would become a true consumer-level product later this year, and he hinted strongly that this would happen with the release of the Samsung Galaxy Note 5. The two other big players in the reinvigorated VR market are Sony and Microsoft. In 2014, Sony announced Project Morpheus, a virtual reality headset for the PlayStation 4. The headset, which is reported to be able to do graphics at 120 frames per second, is set to be released sometime during 2016. Unlike Project Morpheus, Microsoft's product, the HoloLens, is an untethered headset that will work with Windows 10. It is different from Gear VR in that the HoloLens comes with its own built-in computing module and doesn't use your smartphone. It's also different in that it doesn't use an OLED display that is placed directly in front of the user's eyes, but rather it uses transparent goggles with a form of projection or head-ups display system. This is where we cross the line between virtual reality and augmented reality. Although VR and AR might look very similar because you need to wear a headset or some form of special goggles, they are in fact quite different and have different goals. And ultimately they have different consumer markets. Before leaving our discussion on AR, I want to mention Epson's Moverio Smart Glasses. Unlike Google Glass, the Moverio Smart Glasses don't try to be a normal pair of everyday glasses. They are instead designed for tasks that need AR. But like Google Glass, the Moverio glasses use Android. As we can see with the difference in the Oculus Rift and the Gear VR, today's virtual reality market is split into two, tethered and untethered. The advantage of the tethered approach is that the processing power and the electrical power comes from a PC or a console, and these have high-performance CPUs and high-performance GPUs. However, the disadvantage is, is that they are really tethered to one place, to the room in your house, wherever your PC or console is located. However, the untethered approach gives you portability. Wherever you go, your VR headset can go with you. Its portability also means it has a greater social impact. Although using a VR headset could be considered as antisocial when used in public, there is an aspect of sharing the VR experience with a group of friends. 
For example, the wow factor that you get when the headset is passed from one person to another. So it seems like the tethered and untethered markets will coexist and grow together for quite some time. In the future, there may be some convergence as the headsets become more universal and are able to be driven by any device. However, at the moment, Android plays an important role. As we can see from the Samsung Gear VR, it's more than able of providing an excellent experience. And because it already is a full multitasking operating system based on Linux, it's able to do this as well as any other operating system. However, because it's a mobile operating system, it's already optimized for the untethered use case. Samsung's Gear VR isn't the only Android VR solution. At the low end is Google Cardboard. Designed as a way to get people interested in VR, the Google headset is made from cardboard. This means it is cheap and you can get a headset for under $20. Of course, it isn't the most ergonomically designed piece of equipment in the world and you probably isn't going to be very comfortable for long periods. However, as a way into VR, cardboard is great. Google currently has around 50 apps in its featured cardboard section in Google Play. The challenges for untethered VR devices and tethered VR devices are quite different. For example, one of the main problems that faces the Oculus Rift is it needs to get games out into the marketplace so that it becomes a de facto standard for VR gaming. Of course, there are still technical issues. However, many of the problems that plagued VR technology of the 1990s has already been overcome. For untethered VR devices, the challenges are different. First of all, the headsets don't have a main power supply. Everything needs to be based on a battery. That means that power consumption is always going to be a factor. Secondly, the current crop of untethered VR headsets like Google Cardboard and Gear VR rely on the screen that's built into your smartphone. This of course affects picture quality, refresh rates and resolution. Also, with untethered headsets, the GPU in the smartphone is being used to generate the virtual world. Although mobile GPUs are sophisticated bits of hardware, they aren't up to the same quality and speed as graphic cards we find in PCs. And that's normal. Have you seen the size of the graphics card in your PC? What this means is that VR headset makers are now pushing the boundaries for mobile graphics. VR developers are looking for greater frame rates and higher mobile GPU performance. The one major concern for VR OEMs is motion sickness. Your brain is an incredible thing and it isn't easily fooled. When your inner ear detects motion but your eyes don't see the same motion, then you start to feel sick. You may have experienced this on a boat or in a car. The same thing can occur when using VR headsets, and it's sometimes referred to as simulator sickness. If your brain detects that you have moved your head, but your eyes don't see the same movement, then some people can feel sick. Also, some people feel sick when your eyes detect movement, but there is no corresponding physical movement. VR headset makers like Oculus are very aware of this problem and are treating it seriously. In fact, when the Gear VR hits mainstream, it will have its own app store, and any apps which could cause motion sickness will carry a very clear warning label. This is an exciting time for VR. There are some big companies involved, Samsung, Sony, and so on, and it looks like they're bringing out a really interesting range of products. It looks like the technology problems of the 1990s have been resolved, especially those in terms of militarization and pricing. Also, VR is going to be a driver of lots of new technologies, including motion tracking, movement sensors, displays, and mobile GPUs. The only downside I can see is what happens when the lawyers get involved and if the different companies start suing each other for patent violations. Well, let's just hope that doesn't happen. My name is Gary Sims, Randall Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel and also leave some comments to tell me what you think about VR. Have you used a Gear VR? Are you going to buy an Oculus Rift? Tell me what you think. And as for me, I'll see you in my next video.